And the next passage of scripture, I suppose, is an interesting one. It talks about worship and prayer. And just this little passage, these three verses, I'm going to concentrate on this morning. And as I was preparing this, I was actually going to go deeper and go longer and so do more verses. And um, it got onto a subject matter that I thought, okay, Lord, I really need your wisdom here. Because we've got, who's been reading ahead and knows? <laughs> yeah. And you're all going, Doug, you big chicken. <laughs> and if the Lord says, don't preach on that next week, I'll just jump over in two weeks' time and come into something like Timothy, 1 Timothy 5. Anyway, but um, I just want to pray now, and as we come in here, so we have understanding of the Lord and the Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, as we open your word, it speaks to our hearts. Father, in the context we have in our society, Lord, we do need your direction, your guidance, and your wisdom. Lord, it says in your word not to lean on our own understanding, but to lean on yours. And Father, we need that. Lord, we need to seek your leading. Father, as Paul wrote to Timothy, and Lord, in these letters we read today, Lord, we put them in the context of our 21st century first world thinking. Lord, we need to understand your word, your spirit, as it applies to us. Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy that allows this to be available to us in your name. Amen. So let's have a read and see what it says. In verse 8 it says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. In my delving into this subject and reading through different commentaries and authors and praying about it and things like that, it, it really came apparent to me that when this letter was written, there was stuff happening in the church at Ephesus. We can understand that in the context what we're talking about, we know that Paul wrote to Timothy and Timothy was placed in the Ephesus church. It's un not unlike our, tw our 21st century churches, I suppose, in that there's different ways of thinking come in, there's different understandings, there's people searching continuously all the time for God's truth. And sometimes you get, every now and then you get someone who goes off on a tangent. And sometimes we say, well, you know, are they bits of lunatics or are they weird or they're out there or something like that? Because they don't think like the cohort does, like the, the group of people generally do. We look for commonality of spirit. And I'm reading into that understanding then, in the church of Ephesus, what does it say to us? We know that Paul planted this church on one of his missionary journeys earlier. So he'd gone along, he'd come into this place, he'd preached the gospel, people had saved and came to Jesus. And as he discerned through the um, church family, through the home church, he picked out some leaders and he said, I'm going to leave you guys in charge, and off he went. We know from history and looking through scripture that then people were following Paul and they were going in after him and saying, well, if you really want to be a good Christian, you should do it the way the Jews became Christians. And they started to put all these conditions on it. And amongst all that, he sends Timothy. And Timothy goes in as a new pastor. Now, it says Timothy is reasonably young. We don't know really how young he was, but he was young according to terms in those days. He comes in and he has to work with the congregation. He has to work with the people there, take into account what's happening in the context of the church, in their, so I suppose, their demographic and their, um, in their geography. And he has this word that he's trying to share. Now, history doesn't tell us whether Timothy wrote back to Paul and said, "Help! These guys are freaks. You won't believe what's happening here," or whether or not Paul has heard what's happening and he wants to encourage Timothy. And it brings us down to this next part about worship. Unfortunately, the gospel's being undermined. It's being made conditional. We've got to be careful we don't do that. We don't want to make sure the gospel's conditional. You have to look a certain way or you have to um, have a certain way about you. You know, there's one of the hardest things, I suppose, if a person who's lived in the world and knew no different, all of a sudden comes accustomed to church culture and there's a big jump sometimes. And we see it with the football club service and they come, the guys come here for us. And to us, and like we should be thinking to ourselves, we're privileged that they actually come into the presence in Australian context and sit through a church service. The way we always do it, we try to make it a little bit 
sort of accepting, but we will not deny the gospel, don't deny Christ. We say with our international visitors, they come and they come here to pick veggies, halfway around the world to pick veggies. And they end up in church here. And they, not only do they have to put up or, or condition to the culture, they have to listen to my language, which is not very good English. And they and bless them. They haven't run screaming from the church. Because people like Margaret and, and Margaret and a few others sort of get along. Steve, get along beside them. Steve translates for me. He does Okata to Asian really well. Um, now German and French as well. And so in that understanding, we've got to be careful. Okay, how do we make sure that people understand there is a line? It's got to be, there's a boundary about all this. They were suffering from false teaching, saying to the world, you can be a Christian and you can do this as well. Or if you want to be a Christian, that's okay if you do this. And Paul was so overburdened that the church in Ephesus was suffering. What does it say to us in the 21st century? There was arguments, divisions starting to come up. People were actually starting to come to members' meetings and going, I want to say something. Now, I don't know whether they were Baptists. Perhaps they were really into the early Baptist thing there because you know, the basic Baptist understanding is everyone gets a say, congregational government. <clears throat> and so there was arguments and divisions coming up about these different types of things. And through all this, Paul is trying to discern what's going on. And then the other thing that comes in here is liberal Christianity. From reading these very few passages of scripture, we have almost this summary. There are some who said, I am now free in Jesus, therefore I don't have to worry about the old way. I can do basically whatever I want because I'm free. I'm free from slavery. I'm, I'm free from um, persecution. I'm free from um, my husband telling me what to do. All those sorts of things start to creep into the church. And if you read a little bit more and read into the distance in the future, What's actually happened is it says, if you read a bit before about Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, somewhere along the line there, it talks about these guys coming in and preying on the wives and the widows. Now, don't be offended, it does call them feeble, but that doesn't necessarily mean every wife is a feeble but person. But it does mean that these guys were cunning, and Satan's cunning, comes in, he starts to undermine, undermine, undermine. People lose the direction or lose the focus of what God's called them to do. And it really comes out in these couple of passages and it comes out even more in the passages that follow. So we're talking about demeanour of prayer. Well, the first thing it talks about when we read about this in that little passage, it says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. It's talking about how to pray, how we have action to pray. Now we pray as a corporate body. Some of us pray privately. Some of us pray in the corporate body but pray privately. Some people pray in tongues in our fellowship here. Not many pray in tongues during the church service but some people do. And so we have this understanding that there's a way in which we pray. It's almost like a formula we use. It was interesting we were discussing this at home group a little while ago and they were saying we we're talking about types of prayer and and um, when you're worship leading, you sort of get to control, to a certain extent, how people pray. And Graham sort of had the old cast the blanket open prayer. We can pray for whatever you want, what's on your heart. And some people ask for prayer points. And the prayer points are usually great because you get the little story that goes with it. So just to make sure everyone's filled in. And then some people, when they pray, pray the story. And they, they go through and they describe everything as though God doesn't really know what's going on. But that's just how we cope, how we, maybe how we get our mind in place. But how is your demeanour to prayer? And that's what Paul is alluding to to Timothy here is when you come to pray, there's, a, there's a, a, an attitude you need to have. A way, a manner, conduct, behaviour, character, appearance, attitude, all those things come into play in this situation. Are you excited yet? Are you saying, now I can't wait for the rest of this message. Okay, good on you. <laughs> It says, I want men to pray and lift up holy hands in prayer. To lift up holy hands in prayer. In my research, it was interesting because it brought out in several different people, different authors, that is it really only men are allowed to pray? And does it mean that only with raised hands? So why would you put something like that? And these guys are learned scholars and theologians. Only men pray, and only men are allowed to pray with raised hands. So all you ladies who prayed with raised hands, oh, I'm sorry. 
So men, if you're not praying with raised hands, I'm very sorry, but you're not being very spiritual. It doesn't mean that at all, does it? It means the attitude or the heart or the demeanour to pray. We have a look at what that means, holy hands. It's an Old Testament reference that Paul puts in there because he is talking to Jews as well as to Gentiles, but he's trying to lay the foundation. In Psalm 22, 8, it says, 28, 2, it says, Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands towards your most holy place. So lifting hands in prayer is Old Testament. It's Judaism. It's Hebrewism. It's people wanting to give glory to God and they're lifting their hands in prayer and there's more passages of scripture. It's assuming a posture. It's actually pointing up or pointing the direction of God and saying, God, I know you're on high. I acknowledge your sovereignty in my life. In Psalm 63, 4, it says, I will praise you as long as I live. In, the, in your name, I'll lift up your, my hands. I'm praising you, God. There's a couple of songs we sang today where I couldn't help myself. I had to lift my hand and praise God with one hand. Being a good Baptist, I only use one hand. <laughs> you know the old joke, and I don't mean to offend anybody here, but there's a joke that was getting around years ago, and I was just learning, and I was a bit rough, a bit like you know some guys in the church now, because I'm a bit more sophisticated. And um, <laughs> I said, you know why they don't have ceiling fans in charismatic churches? <laughs> anyway, um, we lift both, boom, 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 some fingers like this. No. Um, <laughs> And then I went into Gateway Baptist. Have you ever been to Gateway Baptist? And the floor slopes down to the stage. It seats about 6,000 people. And you look up and the ceiling fans have like got 12-foot blades on them. And they go, oh, woof, oh, woof. But they're up so high that you'd have to really be praising Jesus big time to get up there. But, so it's, assuming, it's a posture of lifting your hands up to God, acknowledging who he is. Now, sometimes we do that in our hearts. Sometimes we do it physically and overtly. That's cool. God knows your heart in worship, but what, why is he saying this? Why is he saying that it needs to be in this way? You see, what it points to, again for the Old, old, restaurant, um, old Testament reference, may my prayer set before you like incense, may the lifted hands, lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Aha, uh -huh. the evening sacrifice. It's a reference to when things were in the tent. I found, used the tent tabernacle because it's sort of illustration. I hope it comes up clearly. But see, in the tent tabernacle, when they set it up in the desert, they set it up in this way. So there's the, ta the Holy of Holies in here. Here we have the killing tables. So basically you brought in your offering, your doves, your sheep, your goats, what may, your blood offering, and you, and you butchered it there and you spilt the blood. And that was to get yourself clean before God. That was your... your uh, um, your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Representation of yourself. yourself. I'm, you know, I want you to get clean before God because I'm unclean. And so there, here's the, this is how I can come into the worship in here, inside here. I can do that if I've done this. I've cleansed by the blood of the lamb or the goat or the sheep or the dove. Then the next step after you're killing, you see a little ramp here. Well, then they took it up and they burnt it in the fire in there. So it's all burnt away and they burn it all and so that's a cleansing of the fire. And then the next thing where the circle is, up here, that is where you washed your hands. Because what would you have on your hands? Blood. So you wash your hands and you've done all the purification stuff and you can wash your hands and as you get up to, as you get up to here, to the entries, there's a Levite standing there, a priest, and is expect, inspecting you. And what's the first thing you do when you walk in? Hold up your hands. I'm cleansed, I'm clean, I can come into your presence. So why is Paul saying this to a bunch of Christians in Ephesus? A bit of a weight, it wasn't many. Really. We'll keep moving on, hopefully we've got the right button this time. Okay, are you intrigued yet? It's interesting, isn't it? This whole, you know, stuff that where people, you know, you used to kill animals yourself, and now, of course, it's replaced by Jesus. So, why do these guys need to do this? As we keep going, keep looking, there's some stuff that comes out. In John, in James four eight, it it says these words: "Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash you your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded." Aha! Another hint. 
He is saying to these men who are professing to be Christians, these people, not just the men, the women of the church that are professing to be Christians, when you come to pray, you've got to be able to lift up holy hands. And you can't lift up holy hands if your heart's not right with God. You can come into church and you can pretend all you want, but unless your heart is right with God, you are living a lie. And so when you lift up holy hands, would God's x-ray vision see the stain of sin on your hand? How many times do we have when we have worship leaders come out the front and they pray a prayer on our behalf? Lord, you know our hearts, if we've got sin, we need to confess it. Convict us, Lord, of stuff in our life that's not right. We do it when we come around and worship at the table. We say we can't participate in this unless our heart's right. Paul wrote those words in Corinth because he had the same problem. People sneaking into the church, people pretending to be full of God's grace and mercy, looking all sorts of wonderful, their hearts aren't right. Paul is saying to these guys, check your spirit. Understand what it means to be in fellowship with God. And don't pretend. Please don't pretend. Lift up holy hands, hands that are cleansed, hands that know what's going on and God knows what's going on. It's interesting, isn't it? I wonder if we should stop right now and let you pray. I wonder if some people are already praying. <laughs> Lord, please, you know me, you know my heart, and I'm sorry. I really need to come to into your presence today. And because of that, I know that I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Please, Lord. I confess my sin to you now. Sometimes we only hear about that stuff in evangelical services or when we do evangelism, people will ask to come forward and respond to scripture. Lift up holy hands. We lift up hands in worship. And I'm not saying if you do that and your heart's wrong that God's going to get you a lightning bolt. He's speaking to you individually. And that's why he wrote these words in Ephesus. He wrote these words to try and get through to these characters. You can't be half-hearted in worship. You can't be double-minded. You can't be, as it says in James, bobbing around, thinking you can live your life, do whatever you want, come to church and put on piety. If you're going to lift up those holy hands, you make sure they're clean. As he, then he says, then the, he gives a little hint here because obviously he's dealing with all these issues and Tim's dealing with these issues in the church as well. He talks about anger and disputing. So particularly in anger and disputing, don't just come there and say, you know, I want to worship you God, but I really hate this guy. We're going to worship in prayer. Lord, I want you to destroy that person. He, don't want you to, he wants you to connect with him first. Connect with him first in such a way that it, it is meaningful and significant in your life. To God sees through the shallow masquerade of humanity. He sees your heart. His deepest desire is to connect with you and to you to know his will in such a way that when you pray, you're actually praying what God has laid on your heart to pray. That you're cleansed inside and out. So he's dealing with the men. Fellas, get your act together. Then he starts to look at the women. And he starts to challenge the women on how they conduct themselves in worship. Which brings in the whole other understanding. And then he says in verse 9, I want women. <laughs> if you stood there, it'd be quite an awkward thing, wouldn't it? Yes, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I want women to dress modestly. <coughs> he says it quite up front dressed modestly. When you do youth ministry and you're, you're dealing with a wider section of the community and fashion norms, this, these few words <laughs> really are so important. We have these things, we have our a code of compassion at youth group that I've adopted from previous ministry because we really needed them but we need them here too is is mouth off, means that you don't say inappropriate things, you try and encourage people. Feet off, is you don't go where you shouldn't go for your own protection. And we usually cite the back stairs. And we have ears off, hands off, thank you. Hands off, 
I want to see if one of the youth leaders was awake. Hands off. And that means you don't touch things you're not supposed to. And also that you respect other people's gear and you don't get into punches and fights. We really needed that one in my previous church. And eyes off. Now, eyes off sounds a bit weird. And it, our kids understand it up here, bless their little hearts, is that you don't, should be looking at devices while you're at youth group. But also, it becomes more pertinent the older youth group gets and more the world, worldly kids come to youth group is how the girls dress. And we say to the young ladies, you want to respect your bodies, don't dress inappropriately for youth group. Because the boys will come to youth group, if they see you dressed inappropriately, they're going to be focused on you and they're not going to respect you. So respect yourselves and dress appropriately. So dressing modestly is an opportunity not to try and see how modest you can be, but just to be in respect of yourself. Girls, ladies, women, I want you to dress modestly. I want you to respect yourself and respect God. There was liberalism creeping into the church as I alluded before, was free from oppression. And apparently what was happening was that because the whole dynamic society had changed under Christ, and I was this is horrifying, but did you know that in Jewish circles, women were considered a possession and almost they were put in line as to how important they were. And I'm talking animals. You know, and there's a prayer, a Jewish prayer that used to go around that, Lord, please don't let me be like slaves and Gentiles and women. I want to be right before you. So could you imagine when Jesus comes in, straight cuts through society and says, all are one in Christ, the ladies are going, you beauty. Probably wouldn't have said that because they weren't Australian awkwardism. But they would have said, awesome. And all of a sudden they have a personality to themselves, they have an identity to themselves, they can worship God to themse themselves between one and two, and it's all happening for them, and there's a liberalism that came in, a freedom, it's almost like the pendulum swung the other way, and so they're thinking, all oh, right, we don't have to do what our husbands say, really. We've got to respect them, but there's a bit of looseness there, we can adapt a bit, so I think we should be able to express ourselves. So let's express ourselves the way we'd like to. And that's where we get into the whole way about dressing. Why dress modestly? There was a Hellenistic, which is Greek, and Juda Judaism understand, or Jewish understanding, that you dress up. And so you come in your finest. Now, it doesn't go really well in Australia. I mean, you guys look great, don't get me wrong. But no one's here in a three-piece suit. No one's here in a really expensive gown. When we first moved to Toowoomba years ago and I first started teaching, we tried three churches. We went to Rockville Baptist, which is a little tiny church in the north end of town, and we were the only people there with the family. And our eldest son had a little pullback car, and he pulled it back, and he let it go from the back pew, and it went all the way up and hit the pulpit. And the whole church turned around and looked at it. So next week, <laughs> we went to Central Baptist. We were met at the greeting. This is an interesting. We met the greeters at the door had suits. And I'm going, oh my God, hello, how are you going? Hey, how are you going there, boy? You know, and the birthdays were there. People own all the funeral homes and they're all dressed in suits. And I think, you know, in those days, I only found out that it was quite cool that birthdays start off in furniture, but there's more money in coffins. Anyway, so, but all through the church, there was all these people who were obviously had well paid jobs and, you know, and, that, and we felt so out of place. So I just went dressed like this. And then we went to South Toowoomba. And of course, all these churches have changed now. They're not like this anymore. We went to South Toowoomba and they dressed like Shri and I. And they talked like Shri and I. And so we thought, oh, cool. So we went to that church for a while. You see, we can have an understanding of what is appropriate. And I'm sure that there's a way that ladies have to dress in Africa that Janine might have to change some of her clothing on the outside. Will that be the case? Or you rock around in slacks and sweater? Not where I'm going, but in other places. Yeah, other places. And, you know, and so there's, there's an understanding there about just what we need to do. So how do these guys who have been freed in Christ, how do they respond in the context of first century church? Well, the ladies got a little bit carried away. You see, when they start to adorn themselves with different things and different understanding, I'll just see what Scripture says here. Um, to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair. Okay. 
and uh, or gold or or pearls or expensive clothes. You see, what that was saying was, in that culture, that was marital rebellion. That this man and his wife weren't on the same page. And so they're actually stepping outside of the understanding of marriage. And so these women were saying, look at us, we're wonderful, we're coming to worship, but we look good. And could you imagine the competition? It was start to get, because women are very competitive. Guys aren't. We just, look. Graham and I don't ring each other and say, what are you wearing today, mate? Um, and I just, Graham says, what do you, I'm saying, what do I always wear? And he says, oh, jeans and riding boots and a hat and a shirt. And I go, yeah, that's it. And so it started up the ante bit. It started to go through like that. And so it became more a focus on what they were turning up in as what there was in their heart. And that's why he's picking on Not because they were dressing well, it's because the attitude was wrong. The demeanour was wrong in prayer. It's about how you come to the throne of grace that's important, not what you wear or how many people notice you. I can get a haircut and no one notices my haircut. Sheree puts her hair up in a clip. Oh, I like your hair, Sheree. And I'm going, hello, I've just trimmed my beard. Do you know how hard it is to trim the beard by yourself in the backyard with the dog trying to throw a ball at your feet to try and play ball, getting wrapped up in the electrical cord? It's quite difficult. But do I get any crudos for the No. And so it was a sign of marital rebellion that these ladies were starting to say, and they might not have been that, but it was what was looking at. Because don't forget, unchurched people watch how church people fellowship and what they do. And because of that, he is really concerned for these guys. And they were saying, and they are making the assumption that the outward rebellion meant an inward rebellion. Are they really happy with Christ? Are they really content in their house? Do they have a, a, a relationship with Jesus or is it all about show for them? Are they shallow or are they deep? This goes for men as well as women. So they just sit there, fellas, with a Paul Hogan head wobble going, are you listening to this? Really? Of course, there was division in the church, there was false doctrine, and there's this appeal to demonstrate respect. Because respect wasn't just for the husband, the respect was for God. So how you conduct yourself reflects upon God. That's not an old, that's an old story. It's not news, is it? It's about how that understanding takes place. First, first Peter 3 says these words, and I suppose in some way we can reflect through these. When, you, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold or jewellery and fine cones. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. So what you have to do to balance up holy hands or how you dress is... What's your heart like with God? Because you can drive cars that are worth millions of dollars to church. Or you can drive, you ride your push bike. This doesn't reflect what your heart is with God. It's how we interact with the Heavenly Father that's extremely important. And then it talks about good deeds. And I found this illuminating. Good deeds. Sometimes Bibles have good works. The, the, the Greek for this is agathos ergon. Now I thought, okay, agathos, agathos ergon means good works, but it means something more than that. And in this context, in this piece of scripture, it has a loaded meaning. First of all, there's, there's three words for good. There's Kerestios, which is a kind or pleasant person who was kind. Oh, you're a good person. I like you. You're a good person. That means different to being good works. The good is different. There's kalos, which means good or fairly or beauty. It's a good-looking car over in the car park over there. So you have an understanding. That's a good view to have a look at in the afternoon. And then there's agathos, and it means these words. It is beneficial in its effect. It's pleasing to God and its action of a regenerate person. That is a loaded term. So when we read good works, as it says in scripture here, but with good deeds, good works, appropriate for women who profess to worship God, it's talking much more than just a person who cooks for her husband, brings something to the fellowship lunches, makes sure the kids are clean and tidy. It means about pleasing to God. 
Good works that are pleasing. Remember we learned that good works, the good work of God was about evangelism, about taking the message of the gospel to the people. Well, now we have this personalised attack or personalised focus on women and, I dare say, men as well. If they're reading this, they're going, mm -hmm, I think I'll get this right, about getting ourselves right and these actions that I do, are they reflective of a regenerate person? A regenerate person is a person who has Christ in their life, indwell with the Holy Spirit upon conversion. This is why good people don't go to heaven. You do funerals, you do enough funerals. Oh, they're a good person. Someone dies and they have tweets and they have all sorts of things up on the news about what a wonderful person they were. That may be the case, but that means they're either a good and kind person or it means that they're a pleasant person or they were even a very attractive person, but it does not necessarily mean they were regenerate. And that's why he's saying this, with all the things happening in the church, he says, be careful, church, that you don't get sucked in by people pretending to have holy hands that are raised falsely or people that are presenting themselves in such a way that they look like they've got it all together before God because it's more about that. It's more about what's in the heart. It's about what's inward. And then ergon, in this case, does mean work, but when it's put together with agathos, it means... Every activity for Christ. Not just what you do as your job. If you're a teacher or a farmer or a retired golf enthusiast or you work somewhere else. It means that every activity for Christ. So when we read good works or good deeds, it has a load of meaning, doesn't it? It actually gives us a fresh focus for it. And here he is. Paul is laying it into the church at Ephesus. What do we learn about that? Lord, teach us, show us how that is not a reality in our lives. Are you with me on that one? That we can, Lord, not just be good at what we do, but we are doing what you want us to do. So as we have this focus on deme the demeanour in prayer, it helps us to be a bit more sober in our understanding of ourselves. In, in, in Galatians 5.1 it says, It is freedom from that Christ has set, you, set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So what we don't realise in our society is that we can actually be burdened again by our own yoke of slavery. We can say we have to do it this way. Let's sign up for this again. We've been freed from sin so let's make sure we are controlled in our Christian life and we put in safeguards and we put in things that make us do stuff and not let the Holy Spirit speak, let the Holy Spirit move, be so controlled we become more about the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. There's a spirit of control seeks in. We can't. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to be free in Christ. Let the Holy Spirit speak to our lives. Let, us, let our prayer reflect our hearts with upturned hands. Lord, what you see on the hand is what happens in the heart. Worship team, if you'd like to filter your way out, and uh, we'll close in prayer in a second. And I just want to sort of just go into the last song with these words hopefully resonating in people's hearts. When you pray, and, he's, and Paul pointed this out, don't do it in anger. In, in, in Mark 11, 25, it says, When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your sins. You see, what we do sometimes in church is we come in and we have this facade we put on and we have this way of doing things and yet we're not right with some. There's someone in the church who's not right in the heart. We're not right with people. We don't, you know, someone's offended us. They've taken our car park spot. What are they doing? That's where I normally sit. How could they? That person's so tall, he's standing in front of me again. I can't see the words on the screen. Why did everyone look on that side of the church? <laughs> and yet we miss the point. We miss the point. It's about letting the outward reflect the inward. And lastly, Ergon, every activity for Christ. I wonder if that could be a little motto for the week. Write down in your mind or on your Bible or on your hand or in your book, Ergon, every activity for Christ. So when you're in, involved in stuff, whether it's singing this last song in worship, playing these act instruments, 
every activity for Christ. If you're singing, every activity for Christ. You're reading, having a cup of tea, and you're yarning to someone, every activity for Christ. You go to work, and the guy at work annoys the dickens out of you, every activity for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are, Lord, so gracious that you accept us. Lord, we can come into your presence, and Lord, your heart could be breaking when you know that we've got stuff we haven't confessed to you. And Lord, that you accept us into your mess. Lord, we need to approach the throne of, of, the throne of grace, Lord, in a clear heart, a clear mind, a clear spirit. Father, we thank you for these words of caution that Paul wrote to Timothy, Father, that we can, Lord, take in and absorb today. That, Father, the challenge for us is to live our lives for you and not to be pretenders, not to add on to the scriptures, not to add to the gospel, but, Lord, make fellowship about what you are and towards you. As we go through this week, Lord, let us live out agathos ergon, that we may be, Lord, your disciples in the midst of this world. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. In your name, amen. I wonder if the younger generation will...